Hello and welcome to the Highway to Health Show. I'm your host, Dr. E, the Stem Cell Guy. In this episode, I am joined by Matt Maruka. Despite his young age, Matt is a fascinating character. He knows a lot about light and how it affects our biology and our overall health. Be warned though, this is probably the one episode where we've gotten the most technical yet. But I still think that Matt did a pretty good job of simplifying his knowledge to a level where most people will be able to understand the concepts and more importantly, get some actionable recommendations you can put into practice right away. Just for more context, Matt Maruka is a student, an educator, an entrepreneur in the field of photobiology, which is the study of how light affects human health. And he's the founder of Raw Optics, which develops the world's highest quality blue light protection glasses. Stick around to learn more about those amazing blue light protection glasses, also about circadian rhythms, how to leverage day and night for optimal health, how to improve your sleep, and many other cool things. Before we go on to today's interview, let me remind you that this show is a labor of love which I do in my spare time. My current day job is running a company where we help doctors and other practicing health professionals become better entrepreneurs, allowing them to serve more patients and provide a better life for their families. If you are a health professional or you know of an amazing doctor, dentist, chiropractor, or any other practicing doctor who deserves to be doing better in business, check out pgformula.com. This episode is sponsored and produced by podcastinabox.co. I remember when I first launched my podcast. I had been thinking about doing it for years. I had read two books on the subject and signed up for an online course, and I still did not launch a podcast. You see, Back then I was running a busy stem cell practice, teaching at a university and traveling for conferences, so it is hard to find the time to start and maintain a new project like this podcast, which is where Podcast in the Box came in. The team at Podcast in the Box handled everything, and I mean everything that had to do with planning, launching, editing, publishing, and marketing the podcast. Because proper podcasting is not just about buying a microphone and rambling on. There is so much more than that. If you're a busy doctor, lawyer, accountant, business owner, or anyone looking to build a personal brand to instill trust in your clients so they will want to buy your products or services, but you don't have the time or desire to learn the technical side of podcasting, Podcast in a Box might be right for you. To find out more and see if your idea is worthy of a podcast, just head on over to podcastinabox.co and click on the appropriate button. When prompted, make sure to mention Dr. E's Highwood Health Show and the How Did You Hear About Us section. But that's enough housekeeping for today. So let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Matt Maruka. And remember, you are on the highway to health and I'm your guide to get you there. Are you ready to live ageless? Want to discover alternative health choices, cutting edge nutrition, and fitness for the entire family? Welcome to Highway to Health Show with your host, Dr. E, the stem cell guy, where Dr. E helps you live ageless. And now, here's your host, Dr. E. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Highway to Health Show. And sitting virtually in front of me is Matt Maruka, whom I just introduced to you on our intro. And uh, here's the thing that I've been meaning to talk to him for a long time, and it is his concept behind the light diet. But before we get into that, Matt, why don't you say hi to our audience and uh, share a little bit about you and what got you started in this journey? How's it going, everyone? Well, those watching the video might wonder why I'm sitting out in the sun without a shirt, and that's going to get answered as we go through the podcast. Um, Big focus is going to be on the emphasis and the importance of natural light exposure for the body. So to answer your question, I'm someone who's interested in improvement of myself. I'm interested in exploring. I'm interested in learning new things and ultimately having a really great impact. So when I was a young kid, uh, starting at the age of five, all the way up to the age of about 14 years old, I was uh, struggling with some basic chronic health issues that I couldn't figure out the answer to. So it was things like gut issues, allergies, and headaches. I did a lot of research. I went to the standard Western doctors. I went to naturopathic medicine people. I then learned about the paleo diet and had huge benefits from the paleo diet, but still wasn't able to fully heal all of the symptoms I had, which learning about paleo, I believed were epigenetic and that I could actually heal through my choices. But food and that focus alone wasn't enough 
to heal the issues based on what I was trying. I went to the really strictest diets um, in the paleo world, autoimmune protocol. Anyway, so after, a, I guess you could say, partial success, I was looking for more information and I learned about one of the uh, researchers and bloggers you mentioned earlier, Dr. Jack Cruz, and was just blown away by his level of depth on the subject of health and how he's focused on mitochondria, these engines that power our cells, and how if they work well, we thrive. If they don't work well, we, we die or we have diseases based on the most advanced research available today in medicine. There's been a real shift in the paradigm showing that it isn't our genes that we're inherently born with that cause us to have diseases. It's our environment and the things we do. And those affect our mitochondria, which affect our body's ability to function properly. So I learned about this. I learned about all these really cool protocols that we're going to talk about to improve mitochondrial function in the modern world. The first and foremost of which is just getting out in the sun with healthy amounts of exposure on a regular basis. Um, you know, nothing excessive. Tried all this stuff, had huge improvements. And then I basically tried to make it my mission to teach what I now call these, these protocols. I call them the light diet in a simple way that people can easily apply and understand because since we moved to this indoor lifestyle, we've had huge, huge increases in chronic diseases. And it seems to be that they're inextricably linked to this, this indoor lifestyle and the diseases we're facing. So that's really my focus. And my goal is ultimately to help people to um, improve themselves. Also, I have a business that you're probably familiar with. I, I make blue light blocking glasses to help people protect their sleep. Um, and that's something I'm really passionate about as well. So it's all about just trying to get people to, you know, the next level of their health and, and mitigate the effects of this indoor lifestyle that we've been living that most people don't even know is hurting, hurting their body a lot. Yeah, exactly. And there's, and, and there's two things there. One is obviously the, the indoor lifestyle that you very well said. And the other one is, it seems like all the medical establishment for, for a couple of years until now, well, not even a couple of years, I, I'd like to say 15, 20, even 25, 30 years, they've been emphasizing the dangers of sunlight. And they've been, they've been telling people that you're going to get skin cancer and you're going to get all these different things. And obviously you, you said it very well, it's not excessive. It doesn't mean that, that we're just going to be outside like lizards, uh, you know, all day. Every day. <laughs> yeah. Like lizards. <laughs> exactly. Iguanas. But, exactly. Exactly. You've seen quite a few of those down South in Mexico, right? Yeah. Right. So, but, but here's the thing, uh, how, how are you based on, on your experience and working with people and understanding this at a, at a, at a much more profound way than most people do. How, how is this combination really hurting us as a species? You mean the combination of just being indoors and being on tech devices or? Well, being indoors combined with the fact that all of the health establishment is telling us to stay away from the sun. So not only are we spending, okay. because yeah. you could spend a lot of times indoors because you're, you're, you know, your job requires you to, but then you also spend time outside. However, what we're seeing is that when we're not indoors, we're scared of being out in the sun. Uh, that's a very good question. So yeah, I would say first and foremost, I mean, based on the research, it is a tremendous detriment to our health. So there is some really good research. There's a guy I recommend anyone who likes to dive deeper into this stuff, although we'll hit all the subjects anyhow. Um, there's a guy named Dr. Alexander Wunsch. He's based out of Heidelberg, Germany. He's a researcher at the university there. And he is the leading pioneer in the world today about how light is absolutely essential to living organisms, in particular to optimal human health. And not just any light, but actual full spectrum sunlight. So the best way to put it simply is that as anyone knows, and everyone knows, without the sun, we wouldn't be able to really exist on the planet Earth. We just couldn't because it makes the basis of all the food chains, uh, for example, the production of plants, which animals eat and we'll eat the animals or we eat the plants directly. But all that energy is coming from the sun. And it isn't just the energy for us to be the way we are now. It's actually a, the energy that allowed evolution to move forward to the point where you could go from, you know, more simple organisms to more complex organisms, that too requires energy because more complex organisms require more energy to function properly and use energy in maybe more interesting ways, we could say, to have that level of complexity. And all that energy is coming from the sun ultimately. So light is inextricably tied to life at every single level from the food we eat to, you know, the mood that we have to the, the, our sleep cycle and so on. So anyway, um, 
it's damaging the body because in addition to our need to get sunlight energy to survive from food, we also have a lot of systems in the body that need direct sunlight exposure. So for example, everyone's familiar with vitamin D. There's good research to show that when we're exposed to vitamin D, or I should say when we take vitamin D orally, um, it doesn't have the same effect as when we are getting it from the sun. It, it, just simply is not utilized the same way in the body. In a way, you could almost say it's like watching a video of someone doing exercise and saying that you actually got a workout from watching them exercise. You actually have to go in the sun and do the work to get the benefit of vitamin D because the light from the sun causes the catalyzation essentially of the cholesterol molecule to ultimately be able to become vitamin D and then do all these really amazing things in the body like controlling our immune system, which is so relevant now. That's just one thing that the sun does directly that we can't supplement with our diet. You know, There's many other things, for example, just being in the sun, it causes the release of this molecule nitric oxide in our blood vessels, which allows our blood vessels to dilate naturally, allows our blood to flow more freely, lowers our blood pressure, relaxes our heart rate and everything, which is a natural thing we can be getting every day if we go outside. Now there's all these people on high blood pressure medication and they're simply doing, they need that because they don't go outside. So there's that, for example, another benefit of the sun that, you know, just to sort of skim it in the beginning here is like, it's the sun sets our circadian rhythm. Many people have probably heard of the circadian rhythm or others might know the circadian rhythm as our sleep cycle or our biologic clock. It's the same thing, essentially. It's a, it's a bunch of different hormones that release at different times of day based on one cycle, which is controlled by the sun. So if we're afraid of going in the sun, especially in the morning hours, when it doesn't even contain any ultraviolet light, that's when it really sets our circadian rhythm when the sun comes up and gets all of our hormones cranking for the whole day. And then the other side of that, which is why I wear blue light blocking glasses at night, is that when the sun goes away, we want to have absence of light stimulating our eyes, stimulating our retina, but we don't anymore. So it's like there's so many things we could touch on, and I, I think we will get into more detail on all of them, but being hidden from the sun, especially from the morning hours when we set our circadian rhythm, and then later when we're able to make vitamin D in the middle of the day, like right now I'm getting into vitamin D time, um, we're, we're destroying our immunity, we're destroying our sleep cycle, we're destroying the function of our hormones, our mood, our mitochondrial energy production, and again, based on the work of some researchers like this guy who studies the mitochondria, Dr. Douglas Wallace, who's shown that mitochondrial dysfunction is the primary root of the modern diseases we're facing, and it's not about our nuclear genes. Him and Dr. Cruz, as well as some others like Dr. Wunsch I mentioned, their work comes together really nicely to imply that this indoor lifestyle is a really serious threat to modern disease, and it, or to modern health, I should say. And in particular, it's one of the main drivers of the modern disease epidemic. Exactly. And, and, and it is funny that you bring it up, but you know, in my, in my clinical background, I do a lot of regenerative medicine. So I work with stem cells, but I work with stem cells in the lab. And one of the things that we learned early on as we were, you know, growing and, and culturing these cells is that if you expose a, a naive stem cell to different wavelengths of light, they will grow differently and they will differentiate into different things, which really gets you thinking of like, wow, these cells, these are literally our, 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 our building blocks and you can influence them to go one direction or another based on the different wavelengths of light that you expose them to, which, you know, not to get too technical, but in reality, it makes you understand why we require as living beings, we require to be out in the sun and our cells require this just to, just to function and to get this energy that you're, that you're very well uh, mentioning right here. And, and all of those things are very important. Now, to touch on the other point that you made, I think every person who has a relative or, or who has children who have had certain kinds of diseases have heard about these mitochondrial uh, disorders. You, 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 you know, we talk about them in cancer, we talk about them in autism, we talk about them in, in, in so many other metabolic disorders that it's, it's very important to, to emphasize and to care for our mitochondria. And there's no better nice. way than to just, you know, be out in the sun. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm glad you're hitting that point, really, because um, honestly, when you say that, you know it because the research is supporting it, but most people don't actually know. Like, there's different kinds of diseases. There's 
for example, infectious diseases, which mostly we didn't have to worry about. And a lot of podcasts, I say, yeah, we, we dealt with the infectious diseases, right? It's funny because now all of a sudden we're dealing with another infectious disease. So viruses and bacterial pathogens, those are infectious because they're external. They sort of attack our body. Viruses and bacteria obviously do so differently. With bacteria, we can kill it with an antibiotic. With viruses, obviously, we need to just kind of ride it out and build up our immunity, which is why this conversation is so important. But that's one class of diseases that mostly until the coronavirus epidemic, people weren't even thinking about because not many people in the Western world are getting, for example, dysentery or tuberculosis. It's just even though those are still leading causes of death in third world countries, they're not in the United States and most of Western Europe. So or all of Western Europe that I'm aware of. So that's one category. Then there's genetic diseases, which are very, very rare, like cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, Tay-Sachs syndrome, Down syndrome, very few diseases that we see today are genetic. And um, those are actual genetic mutations that they've identified. And they know that that leads to this phenotype or disease uh, state. And then the third class of diseases are what many would call chronic diseases or metabolic diseases. And these include all the things that are killing the majority of people in the Western world now, as you obviously know, being, you know, having clinical background and everything as well. So everything that includes, you know, the laundry list is essentially diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's and heart disease are the two top killers in general today. Mm -hmm. um, then that also includes all autoimmune diseases. So that's vitiligo, um, that is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Then this also includes Parkinson's disease, yep. Lupus, neuro, so neurodegenerative sclerosis. diseases. Multiple sclerosis would be an autoimmune disease. Um, so it's a really broad category, and that also includes things like autism. You know, de uh, developmental diseases, uh, autism spectrum disorder, uh, Asperger syndrome. These are all these chronic diseases that are existing in the modern world that really were not common. Just a hundred years ago, for example, my grandfather, I love to mine my grandparents for information because, you know, just picking their brains to understand what the world was like when they were born. He, my grandfather said it was super, super rare that you heard of someone getting cancer. Now, my aunt, who I'm hanging out with, they live up the hill. I'm just staying at this new house they've just renovated. Thankfully, I had a crash pad during the coronavirus epidemic. But every single night, practically, we get together. She's like, oh, this person died of this. Oh, this person passed away of that. Oh, this person got cancer. Oh, this person had colon cancer. It's, it's every day now. Whereas back then, my grandfather literally said it was almost unheard of. Can't, just cancer. You know, forget about Alzheimer's, autism. These things almost didn't exist. Food allergies. The that's funny, another The funny thing situation. you hear so, is there you, you, go. you talk to a, to a vet, to a veterinarian doctor, right? And, you know, they're studying animals out in the wild, not, not just the one caring for your dog, but the, the ones who are actually out in safaris and things like that. Diseases like cancer are incredibly rare. And, you know, if, 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 not, if not even non-existent in, say, like a rhino or a giraffe out in the wild. But how often are we hearing right now of dogs and cats who spend all their life indoors with, you know, fluorescent lights and they're getting cancer and they're getting all these things. So ah, it yeah. makes you wonder, doesn't it? It make it, it, I mean, it, it never made me wonder before just because I never thought about it. It should make someone wonder when they bring it up. But now that I know this stuff, it doesn't personally make me wonder because I know that the sun and it's, effect on our circadian rhythm, our mitochondria, and so on regulates our natural cell cycles. For example, a key process like apoptosis, there's good evidence to show that that's, well, very good evidence, you know, that that's regulated by the mitochondria and uh, the mitochondria are regulated or largely influenced by light. In particular, red and near infrared light allow the mitochondria to be more energy efficient. Um, but all, like, likewise, you know, there's all these other impacts, some of which many of which are well studied, m many of which aren't studied that we don't even know about, you know, that we've evolved again in the sun for so long that there's bound to be things that it does in the body that we don't even, we aren't even familiar with. Um, now that alone doesn't justify going out in the sun, but the research that we're discussing does. So just as far as those classes of diseases go, I, I just want to touch on the point you made. Those are all mitochondrial, all that third class of all these chronic diseases. That's what this, this researcher, Dr. Douglas Wallace in Philadelphia has found. And he's winning pretty high level scientific awards now. Um, he's part of the, you know, Rome Natural uh, Academy of Sciences or something like this, a very pr elite club of only the top 40 scientists in the entire world. Um, he's won awards from China, from the United States. 
And the only issue is that although his work is so relevant, showing that, because essentially what he's shown, you know, and, and you're, you understand this, Ernesto, but most people might not right off the bat, but is that, again, it's not our genes that we inherit from our parents that causes us to have these diseases that we're facing. It's actually our mitochondria has dysfunction, which can be caused by multiple things. It could be caused by genes we inherit from our mother because all of our mi mitochondrial genes, oh, not mom. all, but generally they come from our mother, the ones in the mitochondria. The mitochondrial genome is also including certain genes in the nucleus. So we can get certain genes from our mother and father that go into the nucleus that affect mitochondrial function. But as far as the diseases they're looking at, it appears that largely it is maternally inherited because it, it, these are the genes in the mitochondria that most directly affect energy production, which is what we're concerned about in this case with these diseases. Um, and then the other factor is environmental factors. So toxins or something like living an indoor lifestyle and depriving our body of proper energy production. And what this does, I'll send you a picture you can put in the show notes so people can see this, but between environmental factors, altered uh, mitochondrial or mitochondrial damage inherited from our mothers and potentially, although less likely, altered genetics that control the mitochondria in our nuclear genes inherited from our mother and father. So between those three factors, my main focus being on the environment, because that's the one we can control the most. Um, and it also, I believe, has the most significant impact. That causes, for example, generally in these diseases, lowered production of energy. The mitochondria produce more free radical molecules in it, almost in an attempt to try to mutate their own DNA to find a solution. Um, that's how these mitochondria are playing a part in evolution when we change environments energetically. But ultimately, when the, there's more of these mitochondrial DNA mutations and they haven't been able to quote unquote find a solution in this altered energy environment, which again could be as simple as just living an entirely indoor lifestyle, that's when we start to see these different disease states, for example, because just like if you have a government that has a certain amount of money it needs to spend to maintain all of its programs, and then you cut the funding from the government, then all of a sudden it isn't going to be able to maintain all those programs. So in our body, the most expensive programs, the brain and the heart that use the most energy and have the most mitochondrial density, their function is going to decline. And so it's a no brainer why in this modern world with all these factors, like the, mainly the indoor lifestyle that we're, we'll get more into, but with that destroying our mitochondrial function, we have Alzheimer's disease and heart disease in the heart. So brain and heart being the two main killers now in our society, at least in the United States. So it seems pretty clear that there's a mitochondrial link there and an energetic link. Yeah, for sure. And I think that for a long time, we were not paying a lot of attention to, to this. And we thought that it was all about the genome. And as soon as we can sequence the genome, we're going to fix everything. And, and, and then we realized that, you know, that really doesn't fix a lot because there are a couple of genetic diseases and there's not, there's not a lot that we can do about them. But the other part and what, what most researchers are noticing is that across the board, mitochondrial dysfunctions are responsible for a lot of these different conditions. And it doesn't necessarily matter if it is an autoimmune disorder or if it is a cancer or if it is, you know, cognitive disorder, because it is a dysfunction of our mitochondria that is, that is behind this. And you very well said it. The one thing that we can do, it's not something that we inherit and like, oh, I'm screwed because I inherited by bad, uh, you know, mitochondria. It's no, that's just a tiny piece of it. The most important part is our environment, what we can do and should do and what we need to stop doing. So those, for me, that's always been the, the, the biggest focuses of everything that I talk to my patients and here in the podcast is like, it's things that you need to do, but more often than not, it's things that you need to avoid doing. And, and, and those are the ones that, that make the biggest difference. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's go a little bit more into people who are listening to this and, and, and they're listening to this concept for the very first time, which I'm sure that probably most of our listeners will be listening to this as, as a novel concept, because like we've been saying, we've been told that we need to stay out of the sun as much as possible. We're going to get, you know, skin cancer and whatnot. What do you think is, or what do you think is the way for them to really start exploring this and start getting the benefits of, of being out in the sun and, and getting light? Is it just, just go outside and take your shirt off or is there a specific way? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I have these, uh, this eight step protocol called the light diet that I have sort of developed to allow people to, 
to hit all of the main pieces that are important for optimizing mitochondrial function in today's world. Um, the cool thing is I'm actually going to be doing my own podcast, kind of diving deeper into each of these sections in the next, it'll probably be in the next few months. So that'll be really great. Um, and we will have a guide, like a PDF guide done within a few weeks that anyone can see for more detail. But while we're on the show, of course, I, I'd like to give people the most actionable, applicable steps just to get started without, without just loading people on with too much information. But essentially, so the most important things out of the light diet, the two steps that are most important, one is after the sun goes down, wearing blue light blocking glasses in the evening or just avoiding artificial light so that the brain can start to secrete melatonin at the, at the right amount and at the right time. And then going to sleep, you know, around eight o'clock, nine o'clock or 10 o'clock at the latest so that you can get a full eight hours of sleep before the sun comes up the next morning. And that's, that's an important step because then it allows us to do step. The second step, which is really important as well is getting up to watch the sunrise in the morning and being out, out exposed to morning sunlight. So simply, and, and, and then if you're putting it in a daily sequence, the logical thing is to wake up and watch the sunrise. And then when it gets dark at night, avoid bright lights or wear something like blue light protection glasses to block the blue light. That's really like the simplest number one thing people can do to start having a really big impact on their circadian rhythm, really getting it sort of dialed in once again. There's two other pieces that people can add to that basic protocol is when you go out in the morning to watch the sunrise, um, eating a protein based breakfast within, you know, about 30 to 60 minutes of waking up, there is good evidence to show that this helps to really reinforce the circadian rhythm. You know, there's a lot of research showing that breakfast is really important to get the body going and it's the most important meal of the day in many ways. So, um, and largely that's because breakfast activates a lot of the other systems in the body just when we put this food in. Yeah. And so that allows, you know, for someone who doesn't live in a super sunny place, like I'm in Idaho, it's, it's really sunny today, but it's been cloudy most of the last three weeks. So um, this getting out right as the light is coming up in the morning and trying to watch the sunrise for about 15 to 30 minutes is, is the right amount of time, I would say minimum. That plus the breakfast allows the whole body to sort of get activated and really strengthen the circadian rhythm so that we're alive, essentially, and on, fully on, you know, not just like we wake up and we're on our phone and then we're eating our food and then we take a shower. That doesn't really work, um, doesn't turn everything on properly. And then the same thing goes for the evening when the sun goes down. Um, in addition to, so eating that breakfast early in the morning, we want to not eat late at night because eating late at night causes a disruption of our sleep cycle. You know, Sachin Panda, the researcher who wrote the circadian code discusses how eating late and uh, can be damaging to organisms uh, and sleep, but time restricted feeding, eating within a certain window, um, a sort of tighter window is very beneficial to the organism because you get a very long rest and digest period. So that's yeah, the really the, just the easy start for people. Yeah, we've spoken, we've spoken about intermittent fasting here. And as a matter of fact, when I started doing, like myself, when I started doing intermittent fasting, I started doing it the other way around. I would skip breakfast because it was the easy thing to do. And, and, and then when I started learning about all these things, I realized that it, it actually makes more sense biologically to eat breakfast and then to skip dinner. Uh, what happens is that a lot of the times most people are used to just holding, holding off on eating until say lunch or even a little bit later and then eat the rest of the day. And, and when do you do it the other way around, it might be a little bit more challenging, but it does make a, a lot of biological sense. Now, I am sure that a lot of people are listening to us right now and they're going like, ah, oh, this guy's crazy. Why is it important though? Why is it important to watch the sunrise and not just be awake before sunrise, but to actually watch the sunrise? Yeah. So really good question. So something we didn't really touch on <clears throat> is that when you are indoors, so even if we don't have artificial lights on, which we haven't really dove into this yet, but artificial lights have a different spectral composition than obviously sunlight. And so that different spectral composition of the light actually affects our hormones and our biological systems differently. So for example, the sun in a sunny day like today could be anywhere around 25,000 to 100,000 lux in its intensity. So this is actually different from spectral composition, but the sun's intensity is very, very strong. And the intensity of relative to artificial lighting, I should say. And this intensity is essential for 
turning us on, if you will. It really is like the on switch for a lot of processes in the brain and the body. And so when we wake up and we're indoors, if we spend our whole day, we go to our shower and then our car and our phone and then the office and then the car again, then home. We're never being exposed to any light that's any more than five to 10,000 lux in an office. So just off of the bat, there's these researchers from the 60s who were studying the, uh, the effects of light on the body, and they coined a term that we call malillumination, meaning like in, some might say malnutrition is when you're lacking certain vital, vital nutrients or key food. That's malnutrition. They, they said malillumination should be a very it should be a well-known term for people because ultimately they believe many, they believe based on the research, almost everyone today living this indoor lifestyle and way more today than it was in the sixties are suffering from diseases of malillumination where we're not, we're simply not getting the component. Let's say, well, the wavelengths of the sun, which we could easily liken to vitamins in our mind. And the sun is just one giant multivitamin. We're malilluminated. We're lacking in all of those vitamins. We're malnourished from sunlight, essentially. I often say sunlight deficient just because it makes a, uh, it, it makes it a little easier for people to understand. Yeah. But anyway, so that's one huge difference between indoor lighting and sunlight. It's the, the intensity is significantly weaker. Now here's the thing they've done. And this is well known from when fluorescent lights were first being tested a long time ago. If they took a fluorescent light and brought it anywhere near the intensity of the sun, for example, anything more than like 5,000 lux. And again, thinking the sun could be like 50,000 lux in the middle of a sunny day. Um, anything more than that immediately causes severe headaches in people. And the reason why is because it's not the same as the sun. And in fact, well, fluorescent lights in particular, they have this flicker that we can't actively perceive, but the lighter, the lights due to the power grid that they're plugged into, which has an alternating current, it's constantly going like this on and off and on and off and on and off. And you can't actively see it, but it's in the U S it's 60 times on and off per second. And in Europe it's 50 Hertz yeah. on and off per second. So Anyhow, um, that also activates or our brain perceives that, and that's a stress response because the blue light sensitive uh, cells in the back of our eye called the retinal ganglion cells, they're getting constantly stimulated with that. And so this is what some research has indicated triggers a lot of migraines for people, headaches and stuff like that. And that's one of the things I suffered from when I was in classes under fluorescent lights a lot of the time. Now, again, this will be primarily – some people will never, they'll work inside their whole life. They'll never get a migraine. Some people like me, they'll start getting that at the age of 13 or 12 years old. Some people won't get it till they're in their twenties, but ultimately based on the mitochondrial perspective, we've talked about the main, uh, the main differentiator, the reason some people would have different reactions is because of the level of mitochondrial genetic damage in their, basically the damage in their mitochondria. So for me, obviously I was probably born from my mom's mitochondria with some predispositions to damaged mitochondria. And, and based on my mom's health history, I can see that this is the case. She always had allergies growing up at a young age. Then she's had thyroid cancer. She's had Hashimoto's autoimmune disease. She had to have her whole thyroid removed. So it's clear that she has mitochondrial damage that's expressing later. Her mother had something similar, but it didn't express until later in her life. So it's sort of being accelerated generation by generation. And it's my job now, based on learning this stuff, to turn it around and change it. But the point is, so those variations in mitochondrial damage could make it so that one person never gets headaches from being indoors and one person gets them at a young age or one person it takes till they're 30 to start having that. But so that's another issue is the flicker with indoor lighting. Then the next issue is the spectral composition. So we're going to get to why the sunlight's so important. But indoors, the light, is if you look, if someone Googles, you know, if you Google spectral curve of light, and we can also post a good picture of this in the show notes along with that mitochondrial picture. But basically, you'll see that the sun is this beautiful full spectrum rainbow of all the colors. If you have an LED, it's like a big spike of blue, a big spike of green, and a big spike of red, not with any of the in between, none of the in red, none of the ultraviolet, none of the violet, none of a little of the yellow or orange. And it's attempting to trick our brain to appear almost the same color as the sun. That's what these lights obviously are attempting to do, which is an interesting concept to consider that all man-made lights are just an attempt to mimic the sun anyway. So just really, we got to think about that. Why would that be? Because the sun is the driver of all of life and biology on earth. And it's the only real light source we ever had anyway. So just based on that, the notion that the sun is harmful for us is kind of absurd. But, but again, we want to get into the science of, of why that is. But anyway, so the spectral compositions, so it's the intensity, the flicker, and the spectral composition is totally different. And that altered spectral composition causes a, a adjustment or a, 
a different effect on our hormones, especially because it's always the same throughout the day. The sun has less blue in the morning and more as it rises, and then the most blue light and ultraviolet in the middle of the day, and then it goes down after it sets, and then the sky actually has a higher ratio of blue light at dusk and at dawn, dawn in the morning, dusk in the evening, which also actually stimulates these receptors in our eye to ultimately know what time of day it is, that it's dusk or dawn. Anyway, so the reason sunrise is so critical, like for example, I'm looking at the horizon right now. I have these magnificent mountains be, uh, right behind you. If only you could see them, I'll turn the camera around towards the end of the interview. But basically, you know, actually, why not just do it right now for purposes of the demonstration? Um, I have, so you can see, hopefully the, uh, the video is not too bad. But yeah, so I have these beautiful rocky mountains right here, snow-capped still. The sun rose right there over those mountains, and now it's going towards the south, elevating into the sky. And when the sun comes up over that horizon, that increase in the sun's blue light content is what really gets all of these hormonal signals in the body going on. So to get long-winded, really long-winded answer to your question with the whole explanation of artificial light and its negative effects, we want to see that sunrise because if we don't, we don't get the proper stimulus in the morning to turn on all of these hormonal signals in the body, which really deprives of us of our optimal level of functioning and disrupts our circadian rhythm and all of these hormonal processes throughout the day. Exactly. So our, 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 it's really all of our, our eyes who need that kind of like that slow wake up of going from dark to like orange and to like red and orange and eventually the blue, which is completely different. If you do that, you can totally do it. But then if you wake up in the middle of the night, you walk into a room and you turn on the lights you're going to be blinded for a couple of seconds. And, and there's, mm -hmm. there's a really good reason for that, correct? Yes. Yeah. So at night when you're, I mean, the, I think the main reason when if you, if you turn on lights late at night and your eyes just adjust, it's just because, you know, the eyes are super dilated trying to let more light in so you can have night vision. And then if you turn on a light that's pretty bright, all of a sudden your pupil's going to contract really quickly because it's like, whoa, that's a lot of light and it doesn't want to get damaged. Um, so that would be, I believe, the main reason of, of like a quick response. But still, the thing, that's a visual response that we perceive. Mm -hmm. The thing that's really important for people to get is that these effects that we're talking about, they're what we would call non-visual. In other words, they don't, you don't, we don't visually see that they're happening. Like we can't see, okay, you know, I see the mountains, I see the, the grass, but I don't see when my melanopsin uh, photoreceptor pigment in my retinal ganglion cells is being stimulated with blue light to turn on my circadian rhythm. I don't see that process happening, right? But it's still happening. And so the same thing is when you turn on a, an artificial light at night that has blue light in the middle of the night, that is activating those same processes when you don't want that to happen. Now, if you turn on the light for half a second and it, and it affects you, it's not gonna have as much melatonin uh, su suppression as if you were looking right into your screen for 45 minutes. But based on the even just a quick uh, flash of blue light at night can disrupt their circadian rhythm, which is why I recommend, you know, using not, like red or orange lights in the house or candles, or I have like a red light camper light that I use that I put on my head, like a headlamp. And I just press the red button and keep the white off and just see everything with red when I go around at night. So my house is basically dark, um, except for that lamp. If I want to read, if I want to see my computer keys, it works really well. And I always wear my glasses too, in case someone else turns on a light or or just anything like that. So yeah, that's, that's also d just as much as getting sunrise in the morning is important. It's really important to avoid that light at night by, you know, using candles, using red light bulbs. You can order on Amazon, uh, orange light bulbs, or even yellow light bulbs, but red and orange are warmer and better. Um, or like a red light headlamp. There's, there's one called Fox Deli. Yeah. That if anyone wants to look up a brand Fox Deli, I use it. It's great. So I'll, I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes. Yeah. Now, you've actually, you've actually touched up on some, some pretty interesting points and you know, people are getting from this, obviously that they need to be more out in the sun. And before we were recording, I was sharing with you how, uh, for, since he was born, really, we've, we've emphasized our son being out in the sun, even when we lived in California, like, listen, just, just take his shirt off and have him walk outside. And here in Spain, he walks outside as well. And he takes his shirt off. My wife is pregnant and we've been indoors for, we're going into our fifth week right now of quarantine here in Spain. And she still finds a time and, 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 walks all around the apartment to find those, those the, that sunlight so that she can be there and she takes her top off she takes everything and gets some sun in that belly because we know how important that is right now 
here's the other important part of it. And you, you brought it up right now. And it is all of those devices that are, that are throwing blue light at us. How harmful are they? Because a lot of people seem to just ignore that and, and literally go to bed with their cell phone and still checking it. And, 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 and it is affecting us and it's literally killing us and our children and, and affecting how they can sleep. Yeah, let me just put it this way. If I had to create a, a device to damage people's circadian rhythm and cause mitochondrial dysfunction, I would create a little light emitting box that could be held in a hand that would have a bunch of interesting programs on it so that it would always keep people attached to it. Like if I was tasked with destroying people's sleep, that's exactly what based, I would create. Based on what you know and your experience. Based on that's what I what know now. Do. So exactly. And I'm not saying that that's what the people who made phones were doing. I'm sure I, I would hope that they were actually trying to create something that people could easily use to um, sleep, you know, to not to sleep better. What am I saying? To, to be more in, entertained, to have better communication, uh, to, you know, have the, the benefits that technology allows us, like for us to do this podcast here. Right. Um, but it just happens that there's because of, and this is a really key point to hit on, just like the distinction between nuclear diseases that really aren't common and these chronic modern diseases that are mitochondrial. There's another distinction to be made when it comes to light is that these effects, like we've said, there's visual and then there's non-visual. And these effects that we're talking about with our circadian rhythm, our hormones, our vitamin D production, I mean, most of the effects of light we're talking about, they're non-visual. And so when they created these devices with this light, trying to mimic the light of the sun, that's what they attempt to do with these white backlight LEDs. They didn't know, I think, that that, that light is going to disrupt melatonin. The research in the 80s and 90s when they were starting to build computer, or 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s when they were making computer monitors and all that stuff, this research was, a lot of it was happening at the same time. So people really weren't aware. And for that, I mean, we can't blame them. But now that the research is very clearly solidified, it's time to say, okay, we know that in addition to giving us a dopamine hit by, you know, um, playing on Instagram or whatever else we're doing on our phones, this screen device and the blue light component within this device is disrupting our sleep. And so literally, just to be clear, if you have ambient lighting around, like in a house, it's going to have one level of melatonin secretion. But the key thing is that these um, retinal ganglion cells that I described, which are the responsible receptor in our eye for these non-visual effects. So there's the rods and the cones that people are familiar with for active color vision and night vision. But then there's the retinal ganglion cells, which were a more recently discovered cell around the 80s that is responsible for the non-visual effects. So nothing related to do with seeing. And instead of going back to the visual centers in the back of the brain, uh, like sort of well, I, not quite in the back, but in the middle yeah. back, um, the retinal ganglion cells have, they communicate via the optic nerves to the hypothalamus, which sits directly pretty much behind the eyes. And this is the master regulator of the body, essentially the master hormonal regulator. It controls the endocrine system, which is all of our hormones and stuff, right? So when you look into a screen device, Unlike peripheral lighting around, you know what the point I was going to make is that these retinal ganglion cells, they are concentrated exclusively in the inner retina. So, or based on the research, they're primarily located in the inner retina. So what that means is that peripheral light around us or above us or below us is going to have one level of effect. When you're looking into a light straight on, it's having a whole new level of effect on melatonin secretion and so, or suppression, I should say. So imagine the most important molecule in the entire body for repairing our mitochondria, our energy producers every night when we sleep is melatonin, keeping us young, keeping us closer towards on the line of life to death. You know, we go a little towards death every day and we go back towards life when we sleep. Melatonin is the main drive, one of the main drivers in helping us go back towards life, right? So we're literally, based on the research now, putting blue light directly into the receptor, very bright too, telling the brain that it's time to stop secreting melatonin, the most important molecule that is ultimately protecting us from having diseases and allowing us to function better. It's like, it's basically like shooting yourself in the foot. <laughs> I mean, it really and doesn't get any, any simpler stops, than that. It stops the secretion of serotonin. And it's no wonder people aren't really sleeping. I mean, we're, we're passing out in bed and we're not waking up refreshed and, and, and rested. And, and part of the reason I am pretty sure is that we're not secreting enough uh, melatonin and we're 
we're suppressing all of those things. And, and the funny thing or the strange and paradoxical thing, when this whole COVID thing started and I was already, I was already here in Spain. I mean, I've been here for, for a couple of months now mm-hmm. and I started doing some updates before it really hit in the U S. So about a month and a month, a month and a half ago, I said, listen, make sure that you start preparing and make sure that you still go outside. If you're able to make sure that you, you spend some time outside, make sure that you get some sunlight, make sure that you get some fresh air because you need to stimulate your immune system. And what we're seeing right now is that people are being forced indoors. And what are they doing? They are staying up late, two, three, four in the morning, watching Netflix or scrolling their devices. They're, they're not really sleeping that well. They're, they're waking up at whatever time they wake up at 10, 11 in the morning. They're, eating late, and they're doing pretty much everything to wreck their immune system. Well, what we should be doing is strengthening it so that if we get exposed to the virus, we'll be able to fight it off. Isn't that paradoxical in, in, in your point of view? Yes, it is. It is very paradoxical. And it is not just in the situation of coronavirus, although it is emphasized right now, but this is the way that we are living our lives. And I was living my life before as a whole society all the time. And honestly, the reason I get on these podcasts and the reason that I started my company making these blue light protection glasses is because like, it just is insane that the research is now done and that it takes so long for it to go into the mainstream. In other words, like everyone knows this almost intuitively that there is these, the system, right? The man that is just functioning the way it functions and it doesn't just change easily. You know, for some really progressive forward thinking research like this that's really uh, well it's, it's not just some research it's a whole, multiple different fields of research thousands of different papers and researchers and so on um, all kind of being unified now but for this kind of thing to really step into place it is going to take a lot of push and it's going to disrupt a lot of business and a lot of existing systems like the entire sunscreen and dermatology industry the entire sunglasses in business like but for example, this has happened before, you know, like there's currently a disruption happening with the, well, there has been like the oil industry towards natural gas, natural gas towards ener- you know, cleaner energy sources. The same thing with, you know, there were like, there used to be people who would give all kinds of interesting drugs and therapies that, and whole businesses based around that, that, that didn't help. You know, they used to put ulcers on people to suck the blood out just to, to try to heal from diseases. And I don't know if some places might still even do that, but you know, it's, it's going to take time, but that's why I do this stuff because it ultimately just is so clear and, and there's only going to be a certain amount of ears that are ready to hear this. Yeah. So that's, those are the folks that I'm really interested in trying to hit and basically give those basic protocols like get up and watch the sunrise. And then, you know, because we haven't dove as much into actionable tips, just if, you know, if you want to dive a little bit more yeah, maybe yeah, into yeah, what sure. people well, can kind of do. That was, that was actually my next question. Every time we have a, a guest here, I ask them and I say, listen, if, if the people listening to us right now, as soon as we finish this podcast, what are the top two or three actionable pieces of advice that you have for them that they can start implementing right away? Yeah. So that's, so the ones we discussed earlier, getting, well, getting up in the morning and watching the sunrise, um, being outdoors for at least 15 to 30 minutes. And you can look at the sun right when it comes over the horizon for the first 15 to 30 minutes, depending on where you are on earth. Um, don't look at it if it hurts. And if it, it, you know, look to the side or down or up above it or to the left or the right, and then let it just hit the eye. So it can stimulate this stuff, you know, a couple degrees off. Um, but again, people have practiced for thousands of years, sun gazing in India when it comes up, it doesn't have ultraviolet light, which is what can damage the eye because it's being filtered through so much atmosphere. That's why it looks more orange or red when it first comes up than when it gets to the top of the sky. So um, we can look right at, it, again, 15 to 30 minutes max to be safe. And then that's really important for setting the circadian rhythm. In addition to that, so we want to be outdoors throughout the day, basically getting the light Um, on our body, especially, you know, if we can get two hours during the day, ideally in the morning, mid morning to late morning, that's hugely beneficial. Um, That's just going to help to, you know, increase blood flow, uh, improve the production. For example, something we didn't really touch on with melatonin is that although the secretion of melatonin is diminished by blue light exposure at night, 
the actual initial production of melatonin and its precursor serotonin are largely driven by exposure to sunlight throughout the morning hours and the ultraviolet light. So for example, I found being here in Idaho, um, I wear my blue, blue light blocking glasses every night. But um, when I came up here, I noticed a bit of an impact on my sleep because you know I don't have all these systems in myself totally perfect yet either. I'm still just like everyone, a work in progress, right? And so I've been in Costa Rica and in Mexico for a lot of the winter. And so I was sleeping like a baby. I was getting a ton of sun in the morning and the afternoon surfing. And then I would wear my blue blockers at night and pass out. When I came here, I didn't have as much sun. So when I'd lay down in bed, whereas in Mexico or Costa Rica, I had this feeling of like warmth just laying there and all cooked. Uh, I would sleep really well. And I believe that has something to do with the melatonin that was pr produced with the sun, right? Yeah. Here, uh, once these uh, sunny days started coming back after like two weeks of clouds, I noticed quickly I had an, an further improvement in my sleep. So the point is it's really essential to be out as well, just not just for the sunrise, but throughout the day, throughout the morning hours. For people who work in an office and say, oh, I have to be inside my office, well, just know the extent to which you force yourself to be indoors and, and uh, you know, live that life. Uh, your, is the extent to which you're trading off some of your health. And it's just, it, it, just it, it kind of stinks, but it is a big trade-off. You know, the, the extent to which you're indoors is the, is the extent to which you're sort of limiting your capacity to, to thrive. Um, again, but two hours a day is what Alexander Wunsch, the leading light researcher in the world, told me when I spoke with him. He believes is the minimum every, everyone should be getting. Two hours unfiltered, at least on the eye. If it's the summer and you can get that on your skin, um, now granted, you don't want to do two hours in the middle of the day. So now let's get closer towards the middle of the day with the light. Once it gets after in the summer, after 10 or 11 o'clock until two or three o'clock, the sun is very, it's much stronger. It's higher in ultraviolet. And if you haven't built up a, a healthy tan, then it's not a good idea to get out at those hours. It's best to go in the shade. So it's best to get the sun up until 10 or 11 a.m. and then be in the shade from 10 or 11 until 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock at, at least in the middle of the summer. In the winter, the sun's not strong enough even in those hours really to burn at all in Spain, for example. Now in Costa Rica, it's always year-round that strong. So treat it like it's summer there anytime. But the point is, even if someone can just get 15 to 30 minutes in the middle of the day, again, based, you'll have to adjust a little more or less depending on your tan or skin type. Um, but that's how we make vitamin D is in the middle of the day. So we also don't just want to get morning sunrise and some sunlight throughout the morning. We want to be able to get a little bit closer towards the late morning or the midday to make vitamin D. And then in the afternoon, extra, you know, a little bit of sun as well, like another half hour or hour sometime in the late afternoon is just an additional benefit. And then if, if people can, if you can watch the sunset, that's another huge benefit because that's sort of the opposite to the sunrise. It's letting the brain know, okay, exactly. Well, it sort of lets the brain know the sun's going down and it's time to start getting ready for melatonin production and sleep. Um, so that's really like as far as the sun goes, that's the basic protocol. Now at night, I'm going to tell everyone um, it's really important if you're living in the modern world to get blue light blocking glasses because blue light disrupts our circadian rhythm. And again, that's why. So I started the business that I have raw optics to make blue blockers or blue light protection glasses simply because nothing else available had the frame quality and the styles that I wanted to wear that contained like while containing the most effective lens technology. So that's why I started the business making these glasses. And I'm sure we could make a discount code if your listeners are interested yeah, in getting sure. some of our glasses. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. The biggest thing to note, and you know, people don't have to buy my glasses, but there's only a few companies out there. Um, and we're one of them that have lenses that block the right spectrum. The majority of blue light protection coatings or lenses you can buy today, they do not block the wavelengths below 400 or I should say above 420 nanometers. So if you look at the blue light spectrum, the worst emission from an LED is at 455 nanometers of light. It's the spike in the LED is around 455 nanometers. That's all the car headlights now, most of them. The screen devices we have, it's right around that range, right? Mm. So most of the blue blockers today, they block a ton of light up to 420 nanometers. So they say they're blocking all this blue light. And they even send out a little thing you can shine, a little LED you can shine, a laser yeah, yeah, yeah. through the I've lens. And it's 405 nanometers. So it's, the lens blocks 405 nanometers, but it blocks 0% at 455 nanometers. Because if you block at 455 nanometers, the lens begins to have a yellowish color, which people don't want. But the, the color 
is the effect of the reduction of the blue light. So the more color the lens has, the more blue light protection you have, which is why our daytime lenses that we offer, they have a slight yellowish hue. Um, we're actually going to be upgrading them to be even more yellow pretty soon um, to, to block more light because we've realized that, you know, customers are okay with more color if it means they're getting more protection. And our night lenses have an orange reddish color, which is even more blocking because we want maximum blocking at night. So as far as blue blockers go, it doesn't even really matter to me per se if, you know, your, your listeners want to buy raw optics or one of the other great companies out there. But it ultimately does matter that they don't buy something that's a gimmick, that's a clear lens that's not blocking the right light because then you're not going to get the benefit exactly. of what we're talking about. And, and that's actually even worse because a lot of the times people feel protected, uh, but they're exactly. not really getting any, any protection. So before we say goodbye, uh, Matt, I really do want to acknowledge you for the work you're doing, not only for taking the time to be here with us, but for the work that you're doing. I think that, that what you're currently doing and spending time uh, spreading the word and, and really getting to know the science and, and, and sharing it with people who need to know it, not just with the high-tech scientists who are interested and in, in we can geek out on that all the time, but for the everyday person, I, I, I do want to acknowledge the work that you're doing. I think that, that your blue blocking glasses are, are pretty awesome. I I think that more people should be using them because this world that we've gotten to is 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 really damaging us in, in many respects just for the sake of, of of comfort. And a lot of times it's necessary and it's it's part of the of the perks of living in this age, right? But I think we need to be careful with what we're doing. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing. I really appreciate that, Ernesto. It really means a lot to me. Thank you, too, for the work that you're doing with spreading this information because you ultimately are the one who's able to get this out to a big audience with your podcast. So I really appreciate it. And uh, let's just keep doing the same thing. And we'll have to get you some of our glasses as well, especially while you're in quarantine. Yeah, thank you so much you for that. I'd, have some. I'd appreciate that. And uh, we'll, have, we'll have to schedule a follow-up because we didn't even touch on, on so many other things that I'm sure our listeners will be, will be very interested in. Uh, but Great. for now... Thank you so much again for joining us. For everyone listening, you know the drill. Everything that we just spoke about, including the links to buying some really good quality blue blocking glasses are down in the description. If you're listening to this as a podcast, just scroll down to the podcast into your podcast app and you'll find the links right there. YouTube, same thing. You know the drill. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I'll see you here next week. Thank you for listening to Dr. E's Highway to Health show, helping you learn the science of living ageless. Did you enjoy the show? Please like, share, and subscribe where you listen to podcasts. Dr. E wants to hear from you. Go to dre.show. Again, that's dre.show. Until next time, this is Dr. E's Highway to Health, helping you live ageless. So there you have it. That was my conversation with Matt Maruka. I hope you enjoyed it and got some valuable info from it. What was your favorite takeaway? Tag me on Instagram or connect with me on LinkedIn and let me know what you think. And by the way, remember that you can find the links to everything we discussed in this episode in the show notes. Just scroll down to this episode's description on your podcast app and tap on the appropriate link. Speaking of links, Matt offered all of our listeners a 10% discount when you buy any of the blue light blocking glasses at Raw Optics and you use the code Highwood Health on checkout. To learn more and copy the coupon code directly, just go to dre.show forward slash blue blockers or tap on the link in this episode's description. And while you're at it, remember to check out podcastinabox.co for all your podcasting needs. If you are a busy entrepreneur looking to grow a personal brand and still trust in your clients, there is no better way to do it than with a podcast. To learn how the team at Podcast in a Box can help you do just that, simply head on over to podcastinabox.co and find out more. Oh, and if you already have a podcast but find it hard and time-consuming to keep up, they can help you with that as well. Seriously, they're amazing. Just head on over to podcastinabox.co and let them know that Dr. E sent you. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. You've been listening to Matt Maruka and Dr. E talk about the importance of sunlight and what he calls the light diet. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you here next week. And remember, you are in the highway to health and I'm your guide to get you there.